uh, Rethink Energy's uh, webinar program. Um, this week, we've um, uh, invited a company, a Canadian company, Breeze, to uh, present. Um, what happened is a couple of weeks ago, we, we came across Breeze and we had a nice uh, chat. Um, and they, they put this idea of using compressed air um, in existing pipelines uh, that were no longer being used uh, and using it as a, um, a transmission system for renewable energy projects. That kind of blew us away. Um, so we said, why don't you come and present on our webinar program? Um, and so um, they're going to they're gonna go through their plan. Um, uh, as I understand it, in, in about a year to 18 months, this thing should be going live. Um, and it uses compressed air uh, and it compresses air from renewable energy and then through the pipeline at the other end, it drives a, uh, a turbine and um, goes into uh, a grid system. So the, um, without too much more ado, I'm going to hand over control to Denis uh, Wiart and um, the director of Breeze, and he's going to be accompanied by Keegan Lang, senior VP at Breeze. One thing I'm just going to say is that um, as the presentation goes on, don't, don't be frightened to ask questions. Um, open up your um, side, sidebar, click the question button, and we may even answer the questions live as you type them in uh, in the live presentation because this is a, a this initial part of the presentation is uh, recorded and um, without further ado i'm going to hand control over uh to Denise. thank you uh thank you for attending i'm really excited to get the chance to tell you about what we've been working on here at breeze i have three big points to get to you today First, the challenge the oil and gas industry is facing. Second, how this industry can capitalize on $100 billion business by converting the challenge into opportunity. Third, how the Breeze solution takes existing oil and gas pipelines and converts them into renewable air energy transmission highways. I have a bold claim to make at the end of this and I invite you to challenge me on that. Breeze has a unique solution to some of the challenges faced in the pursuit of sustainable future. We are going to talk to you about an innovation that has been staring us in the face since the beginning of the use of fossil fuels. We're going to tell you about a plan to use our existing workforce and underutilized assets to fast track our path to net zero. Each industry and market faces challenges that can be overcome with Breeze technology. The oil and gas industry is under great scrutiny to reduce carbon emissions. Industry is being incentivized to move away from using fossil fuel. Right now, there's over 3 million miles of pipe in the ground in North America alone, and a growing 25% of those pipes lay idle and are viewed as liabilities. But in order to move to a fully green, sustainable grid, the power industry has challenges that right now are going to take high costs, and we just don't have the time to solve those. Transmission lines from remote locations are costly. Breeze will reuse existing transmission networks, greatly lowering the burden of building new transmission. And now for that big, bold statement. Breeze is the most scalable and lowest cost of energy transmission and storage on the planet. With the Breeze solution, renewable generators will see improvements in capital returns. And the location renewable projects can be built will increase exponentially. Air will be stored in pipelines and caverns to be utilized in high times of demand, adding major value to distribution and the methodology used. Air will then be expanded at strategic locations on the path of the pipeline, adding major opportunity for further innovation. But our first step is to get it back onto the grid to bring access to renewable power to everyone. I will let Denny take it from here to get a bit more into the details and really provide you with the breeze solution and how we will take idle pipelines from stranded assets and convert them into money-making machines. Thanks, Keegan. And that's right. Uh, Breeze is putting pipelines back to work, carrying clean, dry air. Breeze technology stores, transports, and provides generation in one system. One of our clients is quoted as saying, that's amazing, we can do this without new innovation. And what they meant is we have the technology, we have the equipment, we have the infrastructure, and we can put this into action very quickly. 
How much energy can be transported? That's a question we get. Well, imagine an underground grid of piping interconnecting power plants and power users. We can efficiently transfer 25 megawatts of continuous energy between points, between supplies and off takers. The pipeline also acts as a mechanical battery that can store energy as well. How much energy? We had one of our clients approach us with 12 miles of 30 inch pipeline, uh, equivalent of about 30 megawatt hours of storage capacity. Our system was about $10 million to get that energy in and out and very comparable and lower cost than a, a battery and associated installation costs. The Breeze economics are more than just storage. Each location is financially unique. You have to ask yourself the questions. What new market can you reach? Can you locate your equipment remote and then sell into a higher priced market? Can you store and sell your energy at a different time to take advantage of peak pricing? Transmission cost savings. Well, this is a parallel system. So above ground, the above ground grid, uh, we can take load off of that. Dispatchable incentives. This system is charged and ready to go at any time so we can start up quickly. And that is very valuable to many clients. As well, storage. Of course, I talked about that earlier. There's also a hidden uh, interesting development here too with cooling and heating revenues. On the generation side, we produce green heat and that can be used for various industrial uses. And cooling on the downstream side where we release the pressure can be used in various applications, refrigeration systems, data center cooling, all sorts of opportunities, as well black start capabilities. This system does not need power to, to start up. So it's a great black star generator. And of course, the big economic benefit is deferring reclamation of pipelines, putting them back to work, taking those liabilities off the books and putting them back into the economy. Breeze can assist with the business case to really look at your specific application and, and see what's the best. Breeze is both a developer and an innovator. We connect the pipeline owners, the generators, and the power users. Uh, we'll assist with getting your permits, the documentation needed, uh, assist with contracts, PPAs, offtake agreements, getting your systems online. We're also developing an innovation center so we can test new technologies. Uh, some are underway already uh, with new ideas on how to use this new market to, to get uh, energy efficiently transferred. Um, the, our SMEs will be working on standards, regulations, and best practices to set for the industry. As such, we're in the process of raising funds and securing discontinued pipelines. So that's what we're, we're looking for. So I'll open it up to maybe some questions and uh, and Peter, if you want to, if you have anything you want to go to at this point. Uh, yeah, I'll jump in there. Why don't you drop the uh, uh, presentation so we all come back as uh, as video? Okay, that's good. Um, I mean, you talked about an example there of twenty five um, megawatts. Is that per pipeline or is that just per? customer or outlet, you know, is that? Well, all along the pipeline, you could have intake and offtake at any locations. So that's assuming about 60 miles between a supplier and an offtaker. That pipeline could transmit 25 megawatts between parties. So any two points, basically. That's right. Okay. And, and um, is there a maximum capacity uh, is that based on the pipeline considerations, the actual capacity? That's right. It, it's based on how much air we can we can transport through that pipeline. There there are you know limitations to velocity and air uh, you know restrictions. Okay, and who's going to be primarily? Um, is this going to appeal to? I mean, I can understand why a renewable energy supplier, you know, a solar farm. Um, would, would talk to you. Uh, I can understand why a pipeline owner 
uh, who's not getting any usage on his pipeline will talk to you. What other constituencies do you think this this wraps in? No, definitely. Like industrial facilities would be very interested in these technologies. Um, obviously, as off takers, but as also uh, needing industrial heating and industrial cooling. Uh, compression equipment vendors, uh, they, they're they going to be very interested in this technology because it's, it's a huge opportunity for them to provide equipment for these installations, as well as turbine vendors, um, battery manufacturers, because this works well with, with batteries as well. Uh, other users would be engineering firms, construction firms, uh, data center owners, heat recovery firms, um, air dryers. There's a whole bunch of parties that will become quite interested in this technology and being able to benefit. Yeah, I can see that. I, I can also see some difficulties. I mean, the heat um, is going to be delivered at the point where the air enters the system, and that's not going to be too far from um, a, um, a, a renewable energy uh, supplier, and that tends not to be in a city where they use heat. Um, so I see some issues there. Um, but I do understand that if you were to... When you export the heat at the, the, uh, at the other end, that when you uh, warm up the um, the gas before it goes into a turbine, that you you effectively you end up with some cold, and that can be used for things like a data center. So I I, I take that that it, that's it might be on route, but it sounds like it's going to become a logistical. Um, it's going to be highly complex. How are you going to manage the whole process? Well, that, it does need a, a, an integrator, and that's the, the, the purpose of Breeze, is to integrate those complexities, because it will, you're right, it will be a, a lot of in, intake, offtake, heat requirements, cooling re, uh, requirements, and it needs one entity to really look after that and make sure uh, it's like a grid. It's, it's got to be managed and, and balanced. Yeah, and also there's going to be an element of settlements in this. So as you go into the grid with energy, you've got to, you might be selling that to someone across the grid. You might be using that settlement system. You could have to have your own part of the settlements process in place as well. Is that going to be a um, a kind of cloud managed storage facility? How's that going to work? Yeah, that's part of the innovation we're looking at. Is a, yeah, cloud based storage it, it really works well in that kind of a concept um so it's physical cloud-based storage i guess is the way you, you consider it yeah um and have you got a pilot going on now or have you got one ready to to roll and how long is it going to last and what what will it prove well that's kind of what we're working on i can kind of answer that peter so um just kind of talking about the next steps for caps and what we're kind of looking at so we're currently looking to secure obviously pipelines and energy offtakes. Um, the first thing we would like to do is to get our center of excellence up. So that's kind of running a lab and a uh, testing facility so that we can add innovations and really refine the innovations that we're adding to the system. Um, then obviously we'd move from there to eventually moving into a larger grid status where that cloud would, cloud would come into play. So, but you, but so th as of today, you may have a pilot, you can't tell me about it. Um, when, the when, this is, when this is up and running, um, how quickly can you deliver energy? I mean, is this is, is this literally a switch and you start going out of a turbine? Is it 15 minutes? Is it 15 seconds? How rapidly can you um, give someone the energy they need? Um, I believe yeah. our run-up time at the moment is low. Um, it, it, we had, do have dispatchable power, so we're, we kind of have we kind of solve those black start initiatives. So that's kind of what we're working towards. Because people use anything thing with storage gets its first line of revenue from uh, offering uh, some kind of stabilizing uh, capacity on, on the actual grid. And I wondered if it would be capable of that. Yeah, it would be. It's uh, very dispatchable within, depending on the size of the equipment. I mean, it's very scalable too in terms of we could have small turbo expanders or large turbines. Uh, each would have different startup times, right? For right. Uh, from seconds to minutes um, in terms of generating power to the grid. Okay, and then and then they, the, as I understand it, you could come out of any uh, sized pipe connection 
Um, you know, you, you have a 36 inch uh, main pipeline, but you might have a, an eight inch pipe connection uh, to a plant and it won't really matter. You could just increase or decrease the pressure to make that um, work. That's right. The, the smaller lines would have less flow rate to, uh, capacity, so they would have less energy, trans, I guess, a, a ability to transmit energy. The large pipelines would, would be for the main flows and the smaller lines for local loads, um, that type of thing. And, and when the pipeline, how long can you can can the pipeline be and have this energy in it? Is it you know across America or is it twenty miles? And and are there? Do you have to segment it? That's a great question. We we're actually already in talks with some pipeline vendors that have over twelve hundred mile long pipelines that right across the country. Uh, so you can imagine the potential there. Um, you don't need to to isolate uh the, probably for maintenance we would have isolation systems but the whole grid would be open and live for uh for storage you wouldn't need to segment okay so as soon as you you increase the pressure at one end the the the, the pressure equalizes almost immediately across the whole length that's right yeah the ideal would be to maintain a, a fairly stable pressure range and uh as pressure drops, we're looking for more, more uh, energy to be put into the system, and vice versa. Yeah, I'd love to be a fly on the wall at some of those discussions you've had with pipeline companies because I don't know how large those book liabilities are that they're holding, and how painful they are, and who's losing jobs and sleep over it. So, can you give me a clue to how that feels? Well, so yeah, far, sometimes. It yeah, go ahead, Katie. Uh, so far in our conversations, we um, we get a lot of interest from those pipeline owners. Um, those are liabilities to them at the moment, and there's taxes and different gains that they have to pay on those. Um, so this is a very unique opportunity that offers them um, the ability to turn those liabilities into assets. So I find that they're very interested and intrigued in what we're doing. You know, you didn't kind of get any passion out there. I kind of, you know, relieved was the word I was expecting uh, to um, to hear. Um, I think they are very relieved. Yeah. Okay. I mean, just just technically, I, I, I'm I'm intrigued, and I did ask the questions earlier. Um, that w when you compress air, it creates a lot of heat. You have to take the heat out, and you have to do something with it, whether it's a thermal store, or as you said, um, a nearby. Uh, district heat system or, or something um, and most compressed air systems just keep the heat in the thermal store because later they're going to decompress the air and they need the heat for that, that air and it's at the same location as soon as you start moving it 100 miles down the road you can't move the heat with it you, know, you can't put the heat in a truck and go after it so you, you've got to have at the other end you've got to provide heat and, and, and initially if this was at a fossil fuel plant, you may have to provide uh, some uh, element of fossil fuel um, to stop it freezing the turbine. I understand that. Um, but um, I just, I'm just, just, doesn't that make the proposition more complex than it needs to be almost? Because if you turn the turbine with cold air, it'll just freeze. No, that's a, that's a great question. It's uh, on, on the uh... It, it, it depends how you want to use that, that air on, on release. If you want cold air coming out for, for cooling applications, you actually don't want to reheat that air as much as, just enough to protect the equipment. Right. And we'd be looking for waste heat type uses for that. Um, but what some of the discussions we're having with, with these data centers and refrigeration facilities, they want the cooling. They want that cold air uh, for, for their application. It's not a waste, it's a, it's a huge asset to them the heat pump for them it's just a heat pump you take the heat they, they take the refrigeration that's that's a quid pro quo yeah it's a more complicated you're right on the heat end the compression end that's where the heat is generated and and we're looking at all sorts of innovations that actually already exist uh, waste heat to, to power to augment the, the compressor loads um air drying is is another use of, of heat and and industrial users are very interested but uh you know that has to be in the right location right so 
Uh, that's where we see a lot of innovation coming out of this of this uh, market is uh, is around that getting the most efficient use of that that gr we call green heat because it is heat generated from renewable energy, but it is still something we don't want to waste. Yeah, um, and the ratio of so once you've actually compressed the air, um, you started with a certain amount of electricity, um, and it comes out the other end. Uh, and you've used a bit of energy on route and you've m moved it around. How much of it uh, survives the round trip? I mean, at what percentage of the energy that went in are you actually, I mean, obviously in an arbitrage play from middle of the day to prime time, um, I, I've looked at the energy prices on all of the um, the ISOs in America and they, they, you know, they go from $30 in to $9,000 out. So there's plenty of uh, arbitrage a possibility um, for just prime time. Um, so, but but how much of the energy is left once you've done the round trip? Yeah. So we, our demonstration plant, we're anticipating around half of it is is potentially recovered, and but with the new innovation and once we start fine tuning our technology, we expect it to be around eighty percent that we can re, we can capture, and uh, that'll make it a lot more more efficient. And it depends on locations too, how, how well we can use that energy, but that's the, the numbers we're looking at. Yeah, I, I just, I like the irony of using perhaps a, a turbine from a, an old coal plant and having a better round trip rate with its turbine than the coal had itself, which was you know, about 50%. But, um, all right, so um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna open the questions to, uh, we're gonna come back to live. Um, we'll close this down for now. We'll open the questions to people in the audience and we'll see if they've uh, got some questions. Um, so with that, I'm going to click the end event button here, but it'll just be the end of the recording. Um, I hope the wheel still be in. Okay, if I can ask um, everybody uh, to come back live, we've got some uh, live questions to answer. Uh, Denis, if you can um, come back in. Um, we've got an upvoting system here, so um, I won't, I won't um, call out the names of the people, but uh, there's a question here is, has the system been deployed in the field yet? And if so, how much and how large? And we've kind of dealt with that in the recording, um, but is there anything else we can say at this point? Um, about how much and how large, how big a pilot you're planning. You want to grab that one, Keegan? I think you're probably got the latest on the demo. Sure. Right. Yeah, I can cover that. Um, we're kind of developing that right now. We're looking at connecting um, more of uh, different communities together. So we're looking at different labs together and putting them uh, three or four labs together and then testing different items at each facility. So yeah, that is underway. Um, we're looking for hopefully spring of next year to have it up and running. Okay, and how quickly can you um, um, deploy after that? I mean, is it gonna be a, 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 a one year delay or a six month delay after that? Um, I think we would be able to deploy um, fairly quickly, a lot quicker than that. So I'd say within about six months um, after our labs are up for sure. Um, the thing about this is it really is unique to each application. So we have to really look at each application and um, kind of run a f feasibility study on that. Okay. So, All right. so the, the, the biggest upvotes go to a question, is there much retrofitting or cleaning of a repurposed pipeline to prepare for air storage? Um, it's something I asked when I first talked to you. Um, it, it, I mean, um, in fact, I'd like to add to that question, you know, how many pipelines are just beyond repair or beyond fixing yeah that's a good that's a really good question um so it, a lot of the pipelines that we're looking at would have to be uh cleaned obviously at, at end of use because they've been high handling a hydrocarbon that uh, could be natural gas or could be uh, oil um we'd have to look at the pressure rating our our intent is to derate them likely into about half the pressure that they're currently operating to give them that that longer life and uh, there's all sorts of technologies uh, 
for relining uh, pipelines to extend the life even longer than than we can get through that uh, that derating. So, um, like these lines, the current pipelines operate at, at very high pressure, and uh, so we can still get a lot of energy transferred even with this uh, this derate. So I, I think that can answer a few of the questions there. We haven't really mentioned uh, the pressures that you expect this to operate within. Can you tell everyone about that? Sure, we're, we've done our initial modeling at uh, an operating pressure around 700 PSI or 48 bar. So uh, a lot of the lines we're looking at are rated to 14, 1400 PSI. So it's about 50% of their uh, current maximum allowable working pressure. And uh, it still give us a lot of capacity. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the initial modeling. Okay. Um so we've got a question here about whether this can be scaled down to an individual home, apartment building or neighborhood. And uh, I'm not, um, yeah, I think you, if you can perhaps put that in perspective. Yes, I mean, uh, it's true. The underground grid pipeline network goes to homes and, and it, it could be, there is some ability to scale. The, the line pressures would have to be really looked at and uh, potential letdown stations to get into the, these smaller distribution networks. Um, we haven't really looked at that in detail yet. That's part of the, the innovation we'll have to look at. We've been looking at mainly, mainly the large scale loads and, and more industrial uses at this point, uh, or community uh, rec centers, that type of thing. Yeah, uh, so um, we've got this question about um, how this compares with other energy storage. And that's an interesting idea is, is can, can you cost justify this purely on energy storage for solar rather than transmission and energy storage um, and they want obviously people want comparisons with the uh, levelized cost of storage whether you have one in mind for it yet um, against up against gravity towers and uh, um, batteries and heat storage I mean case isn't new like the compressed air storage model is isn't new it, it is considered one of the lowest cost uh, alternatives this system we're seeing very comparable to let's say a battery uh, system, but the added benefit of course is the fact that uh, it provides trans transportation distribution as well. Um, so that's the, the, the big adder, uh, but I would say it's slightly less and more, definitely more quicker to market because the, the, the assets there, the infrastructure is there. We just have to put it back to work. Also, I think yeah. in comparison to those, uh, degradation is a major issue as well. So currently batteries degrade, and our system doesn't have um, any major degradation. That's right. right. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been, uh, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I just want to add that our CapEx is, is so low. I mean, we're re reusing the infrastructure where if you bring in K's or some of these other systems, you know, you have to build a lot. So um, that brings the overall cost down. Also. And you're using um, equipment which has already been built and used for something else uh, throughout it. So, I mean, that, that's obviously going to keep it very, very cheap. There's a question here about how many megawatt hours um, you can store per cubic meter of pipeline. I'm not sure that's the right um, uh, uh, state, you know, uh, per million cubic meters maybe. But um, can you have you done that calculation as yet? Well, the, the one example I, I showed there, it was uh, 12 miles of 30 inch pipeline was about 30 megawatt hours of, of equivalent battery storage. Or or you could look at, let's say the Keystone pipeline, the one that's been in the news, uh, that would be about a $1.5 billion battery potential. So, so you're key to get your hands on that. Yeah, that'd be a good. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting what people will do with the parts that are already built. I mean, that's uh, you can have a whole webinar on that alone. Um, and there's this thing I, I saw about um, insurance that I, I, I wanted to, uh, um, so I'm going to that straight away. Uh, how do you plan to mitigate risk on the system? Is the liability going to apply to you as a developer and if you don't own the system? Um, insurance exposure is a huge aspect of this equipment and the assets. Is that really true? Well, our, our initial, there's, there's a number of ways we can engage with pipeline owners. We can you know, lease the, lease the asset. Uh, we can procure the asset, which of course that would create the, uh, the liability coming over into Breeze. Um, or we could, uh, 
or simply provide a, a, a tariff system where they benefit on on the production of the uh, facility. So, all all different models will have different risk profiles. Um, the lease model is obviously the lowest risk to breeze. We would the the maintenance and and you know, let's say corrosion protection, cathodic protection would remain with the pipeline owners, and that's probably a likely start to the to the to the model. I think that'd be our preference and uh but yeah those are some of the details once we start uh securing these assets but the risk is dramatically lower than oil and gas surely because uh, if air oh. leaks it's just air exactly sorry yeah exactly the risk of, you know we're operating at a much lower pressure uh a leak if there was a leak it's it's, it's a clean dry air um that would be released uh so uh the risk is not not as high as as uh, obviously the existing uh, commodities that are transported. I, I just want to add that these pipelines are very well maintained. They're very you know records kept, and so um, that help that lowers the risk also uh, outside of being just there. So I was asked to make it clear that, that you're an American company because I said in the video that you're a Canadian company. You've got three Canadian parents, but you're actually an American company. That's what something I want to say. But then outside America and Canada, have you looked at um, the way pipelines are handled and whether this is a global proposition and how you might um, extend the proposition uh, internationally? Yeah, no, it's definitely a global, global solution. Um, there's pipeline networks right across uh, across the globe uh, that are slowly becoming underutilized or or discontinued or abandoned. Um, some some would require repair to put back into service. Others are ready to go. So uh, it could be yeah, it's a global solution that could be uh, taken around the globe. You gave me some numbers about Canada uh, when we first talked, um, and you talked about something like forty two percent of um, pipelines idle and and in good enough shape to being used to, to be used. Um, are, are the um, um, you know, what percentage are likely to be unusable, and what would it and, and would you have in future uh, some capex to make them usable? Yeah, and that's that's one of the goals. Is capital would be required to to get you know the the assets back into service. Uh, whether it's cleaning, a lot of the lines have actually been cleaned as part of their decomm decommissioning. Uh, so those costs are already often in the pipeline owners, um, you know, uh, forecasted costs to, to to reclaim. So we would just be taking it post cleaning um, and putting it back into service. So. Okay. So I mean, it, it, I mean, obviously, a pipeline owner might find that the revenues from you make it worthwhile spending the money to, to fix a pipeline now, at some point in the future as, as the business takes off, um, presuming it does take off. Um, right. Somebody here wanted to know about presidential permits required to uh, transport air across the US border. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> it's a good, I mean, it's a new market, right? It's a, I mean, there's no borders on air. I mean, water, if we were transporting, it would be more complicated. Um, obviously, air, air, there, there's no borders. Um, you can't stop air at the fence. So um, there, there's some complications there, but I think presidential support would definitely help. That's for sure. Okay, I'm going right down the pile now of questions. There's one about how many energy uses are included in the round trip efficiency you quoted, presumably you're including the use of the heat and cooling potential. If you take those away, what is your compressed? I think we did take those away, but perhaps you'll answer that again. Uh, what's your compressed air round trip efficiency? I mean, uh, you were saying it's going to be 80%, and those are additional to that. Was, isn't that what you were saying? Yeah, the, so compression does create heat, a lot of, a lot of heat. So we, we do need to use that. If we, if we waste that, that would be obviously a shame. And, and um, not not really a, a good solution. So we we've on our demonstration plant we're capturing a portion of it, but we anticipate we'll be able to capture more and more of that as uh, as time goes on. It really depends on the location that we put the facility. If if we can use that heat to offset, let's say fossil fossil combustion heating, um, like that's a real win for the. So it's actually renewable green heat 
replacing a, a, a combustion heat source, uh, th then we're making a real impact. Um, so we anticipate demo demonstration, we're probably gonna lose about half, half the energy in, in that phase, but through refinement and optimization of location, we'll, we'll get that up to 80%. Okay, I think I've managed most of the, um, um, we've still got the multiple questions about retrofitting or cleaning um, throughout, and we've got another. Um, have we said enough about that, really? I mean, it's not your responsibility, it's the pipeline owners. Um, I, yeah, I think we've probably addressed that. I'm just seeing if there are any others upvoted, uh, and then um, any... Uh, okay. Um, in case of a leak, the owner might have to pay a penalty for loss of energy. How would that risk be mitigated? Well, I think you've already um, suggested that that's in your insurance uh, purview, but um, um, would it be possible for farmers located near this pipeline in North Dakota, for example, to install wind turbines on their farm and inject compressed air and get paid by users far away? Well, that's the whole point of the the business model so i think that's that's a definite yes yeah. um i think the rest of the questions yeah go, go ahead i just want to expand on that because if this is a really good opportunity for those building uh solar or wind parks uh right now they deal with the utilities and negotiate there we will need stations every 60 miles or whatever that ends up being uh and so it's a, a bit of a new paradigm and a, a great opportunity uh, for uh, solar and wind park developers uh, wherever. And it's more remote than being close to, you know, expensive. So if you're a developer and you're, you're typically you're going into a, a um, transmission queue with one of the ISOs uh, as part of your development plan, you could go into a transmission queue to just your nearest hop-off point. Uh, which would be much closer and therefore your total cost of ownership would come down exactly and so you you're not going so far remote and and we think um, there'll be uh, equipment that you can go direct dc to dc and that conversion from dc to ac is a lot of loss so we could greatly increase the amount of energy that is used from these parts okay okay um, so we, we really need to nail down the round trip efficiency because we've been asked it again. Um, what is the specific electric round trip efficiency, excluding use of the heat, uh, kilowatt hours, electric in, kilowatt hours, electric out? That's um, is is there anything definitive we can say that's going to keep um, this uh, uh, attendee happy? No, it's it's just so many factors. It's hard to give a, a hard number there. Um, uh, the electrical round trip efficiency, excluding use of heat. Um, yeah, it, there's just so many variables. It would be really. I'd have to look at his uh, the the question, uh, their specific case, and then I could I could tell them exactly. But there's uh, there's a number of, of, of variables that would affect that output. Okay, uh, is there a maximum distance between the underground asset and the client's facility? So, I mean, I think we probably, you know, they've got to make that distance up themselves between where you are and where they are, I presume that. You know, everyone's nodding, so I think that's, but that, that, so there isn't. It's, 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 it's all about of the developer's um, price calculations. I, I just want to, okay. Go on, Michael. Oh, okay, uh, I just want to say, that these calculations are based on off-the-shelf project uh, products, and uh, just like many years ago, national natural gas started like that too, where they moved it through pipelines. As we add innovation, the distance, how we used it, all sorts of new equipment, it'll just increase it. But right now, it pencils out just the way it is off the shelf. Okay. Next question in. Go on. Just to, sorry, Peter. Just to add a bit to that as well, um, it really is a case by case basis. So you have to really look at each um, application uniquely. Um, so the size of the pipe matters, the length of that pipe matters, the ins and outs that are traditionally there for metering stations that are on that existing asset. Um, all these things need to be taken in consideration to actually definitively answer the, 
input and output electricity, right? And then also, again, what Mike and Danny have been talking about, the optimizations of those. So there's a lot of variables to be looked at, but in our scale and our modeling that we've done, it does check out, like Mike said. Um, again, can we greatly add value to this? Yes, we can on certain dynamics and uh, other dynamics also uh, will decrease the value. Okay, so I, I think um, most of the questions now are getting close to the ones we've answered. Um, I think um, we're probably getting towards the end. Uh, we've had 41 minutes of this webinar. I think it's been brilliant. Um, can you just remind everybody what they do if they want to get hold of you to ask more questions and more detailed questions? Uh, hi. Um, so our website is easy to remember, breezesqueeze.com. Uh, going into the pipeline, breeze squeeze. And uh, we have contact uh, capabilities through there or through LinkedIn uh, as well. Okay. And if you want to become part of the uh, uh, Rethink Energy uh, customer base, um, rethinkresearch.biz, uh, and then click the energy button, and um, you can sign up to our services, some of which are paid there, but all of which include all these webinars as well. So with that, I'm going to say thank you to um, – Chris, Denis, Michael, and Keegan. Um, and I'm going to follow their journey in the pages of Rethink Energy as they uh, hit their various milestones and whether it um, uh, explodes in revenue or, or collapses and dies, um, you'll, you'll find out from Rethink Energy. Um, but hopefully it, it, it's going to flourish. So uh, uh, say your goodbyes, everybody. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Bye. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Bye. Bye.